do you follow up one of the most successful franchises the PlayStation 1 has ever seen? You don't. In the aftermath of the nuclear fallout, that was the relationship of Naughty Dog and Universal. The future of Crash Bandicoot was in jeopardy. The dog studio was out, and Universal had to find a replacement to create the next Crash Bandicoot game. This would take the lovable Bandicoot across the Atlantic to England, where the studio's Traveler's Tales resides. And it would be anything but a European vacation. Ah! Massive company restructures, and with no help from the original creators, Crash Bandicoot would be thrown into a downward spiral of games that would fail to meet expectations and make possibly one of the strangest Crash games ever. So let's take a deep dive into the history of Crash Bandicoot, The Wrath of Cortex, and Twin Sanity as he went into a decline after Naughty Dog. We'll also throw in a few handheld games and a racing game along the way. Let's unleash the history. Oh, that, that's good. We said that we didn't want to work on the last generation of machines anymore. There is no fluff on those cartridges. There's so many things we wanted to do and so many glitches. It's the only time that Mickey Mouse has been depicted as dead. And they were shot. Apparently they knew nothing about it. By the end of it, I developed mental problems, came to a dramatic conversion to Christianity and moved to Japan. If Universal had been more humane and reasonable, it is possible that Naughty Dog would still be making Crash products today. Simply put, CTR is Naughty Dog's last dance with our Bandicoot. It is quite possible that Crash will appear again in the future, but it will not be in a game developed by us. Jason Rubin. After four massively successful games from Naughty Dog, Crash would be under the guise of new masters now. And some would say he took a turn for the worst. If you want to see the crazy drama between Naughty Dog and Universal, check out my history of Crash Bandicoot on the PS1. You can watch it before or after you watch this video. With Naughty Dog out of the picture, Universal had to figure out what to do with this marsupial that made them so much money. 1999 marked the end of the PlayStation 1 era. PlayStation 2 and newcomer to the console war, Microsoft, with their Xbox, were about to hit the market. The Xbox is everything the rock is. Cutting edge, powerful, exhilarating. And Nintendo had a console, too. It's small. <laughs> the discussion around Universal as early as 1999 was to have a free-roaming crash game, not the run along the path of previous games. They appointed Mark Cerny in charge of this as the only guy that seemed to get along with Universal and Naughty Dog. He was the VP at Universal Interactive, which is the video game section of the big movie studio. Cerny would eventually move up to president of Universal Interactive, but by the time Crash's fourth entry, CTR, Crash Team Racing, came around, he quit, but remained as a consultant for Naughty Dog and Universal. But the Crash project he was put in charge of would be known as Crash Worlds. According to Cerny, Universal execs ultimately made the decision to drop the free roaming idea and stick to what Crash games had done before. Due to the immense risk involved in bringing a whole new team now that Naughty Dog was gone, Cerny himself was not long for Universal as he soon went to work at Sony and eventually would become the lead architect behind the PlayStation 4 and 5. With Cerny gone, none of the original Crash Bandicoot team was left. The new development team for the next Crash Bandicoot game would be Traveler's Tales, founded by the tenacious minds of John Burton and Andy Ingram, have been around since the Commodore Amiga days back in the 80s, slowly building their repertoire of making games. Their big break came after they sent some demos to Disney, 
We created a couple of demo levels for Disney, which they thought were running on the Mega CD, but actually were just running on a basic Mega Drive. This impressed them so much that we got to make the game for them. Once we had gained creative control of the design of the game and could make what was possible on the system, we ended up with what I think is one of our best games to date, John Burton. This game would be Mickey Mania for the Super Nintendo, released in 1994, with a port for the Sega CD following. One cool thing is that if you lost a life, a short sequence would play showing Mickey holding up a lily and dying. That seemed fine at the time, but we later learned that it's the only time that Mickey Mouse has been depicted as dead. We killed Mickey Mouse? Maybe we should get t-shirts made. John Burton. Making Disney happy means making more Disney games, so Traveler's Tales would go on to release the Toy Story video game. Traveler's Tales, or TT as I, and soon everybody would eventually call them, followed this up with Toy Story 2 the game. This would prompt another big video game company to approach them. Sega! Sega approached us and said they wanted us to create a new Mega Drive game. We said that we didn't want to work on the last generation of machines anymore. They said that the game they wanted us to work on was Sonic. We told them how much we loved working on the last generation of machines. John Burton. This would result in TT making Sonic 3D Blast and Sonic R. From TT's successful foray into licensed properties, you can start to see why Universal would deem Traveler's Tales worthy of making Crash Bandicoot titles. Universal only had to make a deal with Sony, and the marsupial would continue his reign as a de facto mascot for the PlayStation brand. Sadly, this would not happen. In September of 2000, IGN released an article saying Universal and Konami had signed a deal instead. This meant Konami would be the publisher for Universal's upcoming slate of games. Game development, though, was still left up to Universal and whomever they picked. Konami was only the publisher, meaning Crash would no longer be the PlayStation's mascot. He would be Universal's mascot. To further complicate things, Vivendi Media Empire bought Seagram's company, LTD. Who's Seagram's, you might ask? They owned Universal, believe it or not. On December 8th, 2000, they became the Vendi Universal SA. What do all these corporate shenanigans mean? It means that during these negotiations, TT was delayed in being able to make the next crash game. They couldn't do anything until the deals were finalized. While TT was stuck in corporate negotiation hell, Crash would release his final game on the PlayStation 1, known as Crash Bash. Yeah, it's Crash's version of Mario Party. Not the worst game. TT had nothing to do with Crash Bash, that was developed completely by the now defunct Eurocom Entertainment software. While Crash Bash was parting his way onto the scene, the Vendi Universal crossed their corporate T's and dotted their intellectual property I's, finally allowing TT to start on the new Crash game in late 2000, not long after Crash Bash's release, giving them only 12 months to complete the game. Not exactly ideal. In the original design document, the story centered around the solar system of Tibin Coda, where Crash's main villain, Dr. Neo Cortex, has turned the once peaceful planets here into his very own lab experiment. He's converted one of the planets to extreme heat, another to extreme cold, blocked the sunlight for another, and flooded one into a water world. Cortex would also be working for a bigger villain. There's always a bigger fish. This bigger baddie is Elemental, whose evil plan is to create battle drones to take over the universe. See, each planet is supposed to be an element. Fire, ice, light, and water. Hence the villain being named Elemental. Yeah, we get it. So how much of this story made it into the final game? Almost none of it. Instead, they fell back onto the tried and true main villains, Unka Unka and Cortex. Them, along with the lesser villains from previous Crash games, gathered around, Knights of the Round Table style, and talked. And what's to talk about? Crash must be eliminated! Unka Unka wants to destroy Crash once and for all. Luckily for Unka Unka, Cortex happens to have, and I quote, a genetically enhanced super weapon of unbelievable strength. 
it's just lacking a power source. How do I get into these situations? Ugh. But Cortex figures if they awaken the elementals, see, they managed to slip in the elemental stuff somewhere. Now, with these elementals, Cortex could harness their destructive power, which would power Cortex's machine of destructive power. Ready to face my wrath, Crash Bandicoot! <laughs> The Elementals will be an all-star cast. This is where we get Luke Skywalker, also known as Mark Hamill, his voice. And his voice here does not sound like any other voice he's done. Bring that, sir. It looks flammable. Check out this voice. What are you looking at, fuzzhead? If it sounds familiar to you, it might be because... What are you looking at, butthead? Yep, it's Biff, the actual Thomas F. Wilson. And with two iconic voices such as these, you gotta compliment them with another iconic voice. Why oh, you little maggot? You make me wanna vomit! R. Lee Erme. They're gonna have to hang you out to dry when I get through with you! The fourth elemental will be played by Jess Harnell, who was, um, uh, wait, I have it right here. He was, uh, ah, yes, he was the voice of Wacko Warner in the Animaniacs. See, an all-star elemental cast. The Crash Bandicoot, eh? Oh, I've heard so much about you. Clancy Brown would be returning as the voice of Cortex and Unka Unka. Brendan O'Brien and Debbie Derryberry were back as Crash and Coco, respectively. A new Bandicoot was also added to the mix, Crush Bandicoot. Crash's roided out pseudo brother created by Cortex as another villain for Crash. Musically, the Crash theme by Josh Mansell's back, though, it's got a kind of techno revive rearranged sound to it. Which is composed by Shallow Studios, Andy Blythe and Martin Jostra, giving the game quite a different sound to it. A lot of people really like it. The typical crash formula of platforming is all here. Vehicle levels are back in force with a multitude of variety. Fighter planes, or rather bug planes, are here. Channeling their inner movie influences, TT let you drive a mech straight out of the movie, Aliens. There's also Jeep chase levels taken right from Jurassic Park. Okay, maybe with the rhinos, it's more of a Jumanji thing. Coco is playable again. This time, though, she has the karate chopping martial arts skills. Hiya! Coincident she's on all the Japanese levels? I think not. Originally, the game was called Crash World because Crash was supposed to go from planet to planet to stop Cortex's research center and restore each planet to its former beauty. That changed to the virtual hub where Crash would go from hub section to hub section, completing levels and collecting crystals, which is basically what you did in the prior Crash games. So with the planets out, the Crash World's title made little sense. Enter new title. Crash Bandicoot, the Wrath of Cortex. Under their tight time frame, TT still managed to finish the game in time for its 2001 release, Universal trying to maintain slash repair its relationship with Sony by giving the PS2 version of the game an early exclusive October release, followed by the Xbox and GameCube ports, and the reception was... mixed, to say the least. Metacritic has it at a 66, with a lot of reviews praising the game's graphics, but panning it for a lack of innovation or anything new to the Crash formula. The GameCube version of the game received the most scathing reviews. More split on the Wrath of Cortex, though, was the Crash community. Some fans really enjoyed the game, others feeling it was derivative and, at times, downright boring. One thing most of the community agrees on, though, is the game's incredibly long loading times. Xbox load times fare better than the other two platforms. PS2 would later release a Greatest Hits version, 
with better loading times. Commercially, Wrath of Cortex was a relative success. I'll let the game's dev, Daniel Tonkin, weigh in. I found it interesting because, critically, it was received, I think, quite poorly in general. But commercially, it performed very, very well. It's still got the sort of sales figures now that most games would desperately love to achieve. It's over 3.5 to 4 million units by this stage, which is very successful. Daniel Tonkin. From my data, it was more like 1.56 million units. But who's counting? GT was also enlisted to make a new crash racing game, one they would eventually lose to another studio. What have we got? Traveler's Tales would get another shot at Crash. But first, let's take a step back. It's about to get huge in a small way. In December of 2000, when Vivendi and Universal tied the knot, they were approached by the Albany-based game studio known as Vicarious Visions, who had made classics for the Game Boy such as Tony Hawk Pro Skater and my personal favorite, Barbie Magic Genie Adventure. So Vicarious Visions, or Vivi, as I and they like to call themselves, showed off their new Game Boy Advance technology to Vivendi Universal. Vivendi Universal was impressed, and now they had signed a publishing deal with Konami, allowing them to put Crash on other platforms. Vivi had inadvertently put themselves in prime position to be the new Crash Bandicoot Game Boy Advance developer. In an IGN interview with Karthik Bala, Vivi's co-founder explained more. At the time, we didn't know that the developers for Crash GBA hadn't been picked, so Universal seemed fairly impressed with our work and asked us to submit a concept. We did. They liked it. They commissioned a prototype. We delivered. The prototype looked like Crash PSX, but on a handheld. We got the deal. Then the real work began. Indeed it did. Their most difficult task ended up being bringing the platform mechanics of the PlayStation to the Game Boy Advance. Tentatively titled Crash Bandicoot XS, extra small, the VV team went through a nine-month development cycle, from concept to completion. The programming team blossomed in size with up to nine programmers, which is a lot for a Game Boy Advance game. The game also finished on time and on budget. On February 25th, 2002, came the now titled Crash Bandicoot The Huge Adventure, named after their other game, Barbie Magical Genie Adventure. Okay, maybe not. The Huge Adventure takes place after the events of Crash 3 Warped, which is funny because the Wrath of Cortex did not follow the events of Crash 3. But the Game Boy Advance games of Crash should be in an alternate universe timeline, where the evil Dr. Cortex created a device that shrunk the planet with Crash and everyone in it. Now Crash must journey around the world collecting crystals so Coco can power a device to reverse the shrinkage. Crash the Huge Adventure received generally positive reviews, citing impressive graphics for the Game Boy Advance and gameplay that felt like classic Crash games. The criticism of the game was its lack of innovation. I feel like we're seeing a theme here. Electronic Games Monthly Review, though, throws some shade on Wrath of Cortex, saying, Crash for the GBA is what the PS2 game wanted to be. Ouch. Crash Bandicoot The Huge Adventure went on to sell 750,000 copies, with $19 million in earnings by August 2006. A huge success on a small, hand-sized platform. Universal must have really liked VV because for the next Crash Racing game that TT was working on, it got transferred over to VV. Why the change? It's an unsolved mystery. Not much is known of Traveler's Tales version of the game, save for this artwork of a new character created by them, named Nina Cortex. The game titled Crash Racing 2 would have featured her debut before TT's next Crash game. But alas, that was not meant to be. With Vivi in charge, they would now change more than just the title. TT initially planned for the vehicles to take damage until you only had one wheel remaining. Whoa! 
getting repair pickups around the track would fix this. That whole idea was gone, in favor of a spiritual sequel slash remake of the original Crash Team Racing. Despite complaints from critics and fans that the Crash game series was doing nothing new, it seems Vivendi Universal wanted the Crash series to keep doing nothing new. Now that Vivi had control of the next Crash Racing game, one of the first things they did was track down Charles Zimbilis, the original character designer of Crash Bandicoot himself. Vivi hired him to do the art for the new racing game. Charles, in turn, brought in Joe Pearson, who hadn't worked on a Crash game since the very first Crash game. Pearson had been instrumental in creating much of the lore and artwork in the first Crash Bandicoot game. After a falling out with Naughty Dog, he hadn't worked on a Crash game since. The team at Vicarious Visions tracked down Charles and then he brought me back in on Nitro Car. That was a great reunion. This time around, I was able to direct, design, and storyboard the 40 minutes of the game cinematics in addition to doing some of the key background design. It was fun being able to plug in some of the original elements, like the castle and the interiors. Joe Pearson. It's actually 32 minutes of cinematic, but who's counting? Zimbos would take on the character art while Pearson would take on the backgrounds. They had other artists for the vehicle designs. For the first time in a Crash game, full motion video, or FMVs, were added because they were all the rage in gaming at the time. Developed by Red Eye Studios, the FMVs were done by eight artists to create 32 minutes of pre-rendered in-game cutscenes. They completed these scenes in 15 weeks, which amounted to each artist completing about 15 shots a day or 15 seconds of animation per day. For reference, they used the concept art provided by Vivi, allowing them to better enhance the details of the 27 characters in the game for the cinematic scenes. Being a spiritual successor to CTR, story-wise, that meant aliens. Last time, the alien villain was Nitrous Oxide. But in the new game, there would be a new cosmic supervillain, because... There's always a bigger fish. The big cosmic fish is... Emperor Velo the 27th, ruler of this galaxy. Maybe short for velocity. Who knows? Anyway, Emperor Velo the 27th abducts Crash and his friends. While he's at it, he also nabs Cortex and his minions. All of them are taken to a spacey coliseum, where Velo reveals his grand plans. Crash's team will race against Cortex's team for entertainment to Velo and his green people. Should they refuse, he'll destroy their planet. But should they win, they'll gain back their freedom. Do you accept my challenge? When you start the game, you get to pick between Team Crash and Team Cortex. Then much of the game plays out like the original CTR, using various power-ups to boost your speed and drifting to- oh, excuse me, power sliding to gain speed. Grabbing crates on the racetrack also gains you weapons to annoy opponents with, much like in Mario Kart. Tracks are bigger this time around with some gravity-defying moments typically found in futuristic racing games. <laughs> Titled Crash Nitro Kart, it was announced before the Expo of E3 in the year of 2003 and released on November 11th of that same year. Two mixed reviews for the PlayStation 2, GameCube, and... Engage versions. Remember Engage? Engage. Yeah, me neither. Reviews for Nitro Kart were better for the Xbox and Game Boy Advance versions over the PS2 and GameCube versions. Praised as a typical fun racing game, it's also the most criticized point that it brought nothing new to the genre. We've gone over three games, and all three have this same critique. Nitro Kart sales were decent, with 1.65 million units sold, with most of the sales being on the PlayStation 2 and Europe being the largest number of buyers. There were also talks of a Crush Bandicoot game, pitched by Magenta Software in 2004, starring Crash's evil twin, Crush Bandicoot. In a wacky open-world sci-fi environment with Cortex still as the main villain, Vivendi Universal ultimately declined to do this game. While TT was running into numerous problems on their next Crash game, Vivi on the other hand was pumping out the Crash handheld games, 
Crash Bandicoot 2 and Trance released on January 7, 2003 for the Game Boy Advance, not to be confused with the original Crash 2 Cortex Strikes Back, because Entranced is a sequel to the prior GBA title, The Huge Adventure. You know, an alternate universe type thing. The gameplay for Entranced is pretty much verbatim like its predecessor, with a few new types of levels and new moves have been added to Crash for good measure. Reviews for Entrance were generally positive, saying the game was loads of fun, but said it basically was the same gameplay-wise from the previous Crash GBA title. What a surprise. Back in the UK, Traveler's Tales set up Traveler's Tales Oxford Branch, and they have one charge before them. Revive the Crash Bandicoot franchise. Wrath of Cortex's lukewarm reception couldn't happen again. Otherwise, Crash Bandicoot games would be at an end. TT Oxford had a lot riding on them, as this was a whole new team. Different from the team that worked on Wrath of Cortex. They intended to make something new, something different, something that would return Crash to his former glory. And this would give us one of the strangest Crash games ever conceived. John Burton wanted to see what the new Oxford team in charge of Crash could do, resulting in them creating a tech demo that would show off their skills. Utilizing assets from Wrath of Cortex, they made a little demo where Crash and Coco had to escape from a zoo prison slash enclosure. That was good enough for Mr. Burton, what have I got? and the new Dream Team set out to revitalize Crash. Dubbed Crash Evolution, it was slated to be a more open world game with a sci-fi setting, an epic story, and some RPG elements thrown in for further awesomeness. The game's developer, Paul Gardner, adds further details. Evolution began with Crash Islands being stolen from the Earth by the evil twins and used as a jigsaw piece in one giant planet made from pieces of others. Paul Gardner. The evil twins. New baddies to add to the Crash Baddie list. There's always a bigger fish. Based off lead concept artist R.M. Albon's girlfriends too, as he called them hateful cockatiel birds. As the team got to work, they'd send many prototype workings of the game over to Mr. Burton at the main studio to show off their progress as the team iterated on the game's development. There are many ideas that didn't make it. Foofy, for example, was this alien blob that was going to shoot from Crash's arm to allow him to swing around the level. This creature also acted as a space age key, a shield, and goodness knows what else. R.M. Albon. Worse than ideas that didn't make it in was this other game that came out. A game remarkably similar to what they were making. The release of Ratchet and Clank veered the team in a different direction, causing them to throw out much of the work they had already done. In many ways, they had to start over. However, this didn't give them more time to finish the game as production was already taking too long. In the interim of TT Oxford's Crash, VV would release their final Game Boy Advance Crash Bandicoot game. And many would say it was their worst. <laughs> Called Crash Bandicoot Purple, Ripto's Rage released in conjunction with Spyro Orange, The Cortex Conspiracy. The release features the two biggest PS1 heroes, Crash and Spyro the Dragon, in a team-up. Both characters owned by Universal, conveniently. The bonds of these two are even closer as Spyro is made right next to Crash on the Universal backlot by their neighbors, Insomniac Games. The idea for the crossover came from Vicarious Visions, wanting to do something different than they had done before. Believe me, true to VV tradition, there is no fluff on those cartridges. It's all invested in the animation, art, and most importantly, the gameplay. Toby Sonier, game developer Crash Bandicoot Purple. Fluff. Crash can do his spin and double jump in this game, but they took out his slide and his body slam. But I guess that's because... There is no fluff on those cartridges. Different in Crash Purple is the addition of minigames. Lots of minigames. Okay, not different for a Crash game, as there was this other game. 
that had mini games, but different for a VV Crash GBA game. There is no fluff on those cartridges. You said it, Toby. Reviews for Crash Bandicoot Purple were mostly positive, with Spyro Orange getting the worst ratings. Purple garnered positivity from reviewers citing the fun minigames and the game's overall charm, its fault being a weak story and dumbed-down platforming. Though if you look around YouTube today, Crash Bandicoot Purple is pretty universally hated. Do you know what? In the case of Crash Bandicoot Purple Rip Goes Rampage, I could go less than five. In fact, I can sum it up in three words. This game sucks! Honestly, one of the worst games I have ever played. It is total fucking garbage. This game, this fucking shitty asshole of a game gets three out of ten. However, this would be the final GBA Crash game from Vivi. Possibly because in less than a year, They would be acquired by Activision in 2005. There was this leaked picture of a canceled Crash game at VV, but this pick is all that is known. One last thing about Crash Purple was the introduction of the character Nina Cortex, a character created by TT when they were doing the Crash Racing game before they had to hand it over to VV. Her debut was supposed to be in the new TT Crash game, but with so many development problems, VV's Purple beat them to the punch. Seems though no one thought to tell TT Oxford about this. Yeah, I actually remember when we first found out about that. I was looking through some of the newly released screenshots from Crash Fusion, the European title for Crash Purple, and could just make out the image of Nina Cortex's portrait on the HUD, if I'm remembering correctly. I, I went over to the lead designer and the producer and pointed this out to them, and they were shocked. Apparently, they knew nothing about it. Keith Webb. As revamping their Crash Evolution title went on, and on, and on, the long hours of crunch really started to take its toll on the Oxford team. Since Ratchet and Clank killed TT's space adventure of Crash, it was decided that they would be returning to the tropical Wumpa Islands, where Crash was from where you could run around freely in various areas, exploring and doing side activities while still playing through the story in a linear fashion. And the story. This is a bit of a strange one. Set three years after the events of Wrath of Cortex, on the Wumpa Islands, Cortex blasts Coco, knocking her out. And then he decides to... Crash! Crash! Where are you, big brother? There's something weird going on in the bay! Come see! And it worked. Crash follows Cortex. If they get into a tussle, Crash wins. Obviously. And then out of nowhere, these two show up. Ooh, that feels good. I was bursting in there. From another dimension. It's the evil twins. The hateful cockatails. Yeah, they're still around. Still the main villains. There's always a bigger fish. Named Victor and Moritz, after the character Victor Moritz in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, they threaten to steal Cortex's brain, so Cortex begs Crash for help. You have to help me, Crash. You heard them. They want to destroy our island home, humiliate and enslave you, and steal my brain! And that's all it takes, and now you're teamed up with Cortex. And this is how the game goes. You go from one crazy thing to another. You can link up with Cortex using and abusing him to progress. Later in the game, you play as Cortex using his blaster gun. And then even later in the game, you finally get to play as TT's favorite character, Nina Cortex. Clancy Brown this time would not be returning as Cortex, as the part went to Lex Lang instead. Why? Well, rumor has it that Clancy's voice was deemed too mean. Now you die. <laughs> I got this from a Reddit post, so take it with a grain of salt. 
The director described the character and I heard signature samples of others who had played the part before me. Then I was given the freedom to have fun with it and develop the character with the director. We eventually got to a point where we were all laughing at the lines and the characters, so we stuck with that depiction of Cortex. Master evil with a bit of childish feminine side that leaks out in his tirades. A big change came in the form of the game's music, as the acapella band called Spiral Mouth was chosen to do the game's score. Acapella being, yeah, the entire game's soundtrack was done completely by people's voices. As pieces of the game were coming together, I did read interviews with some devs that spoke about tensions rising when Universal Vivendi sent over an American producer. Seems he would randomly sit behind them while they were working, with a football in hand, watching them. Another story about the same producer, apparently, was he witnessed a mugging outside, then ran into T.T. Oxford, grabbed a baseball bat, then ran back out to stop the muggers. But this is not from a dev who actually saw this happen, so again, take this with a grain of salt. One thing is for sure, that towards the end, Crunch at TT at Oxford hit them hard. Things were really pleasant and fun in the early days, but as inevitable deadlines loomed and Crunch started to set in, by the end of it I had developed mental problems, came to a dramatic conversion to Christianity and moved to Japan. Kingsley Stevens. Due to time and making sure that the game didn't crash when you played it, there were certain things that got cut. Like there was a bug run at the beginning of the game. And also there was this part of the game called Gone A Bit Coco, where you would travel into Coco's mind, shooting massive swarms of cute creatures. If the game seems a bit out there, well, they did want to be different. And they did want to embrace humor to the fullest. Hence the title would have to say it all. We went through lots of different titles before we chose to Insanity. Fully Fluxed was another possibility. Eventually, Vivendi gave us an ultimatum. We had one hour to choose a title, or the title would be unlimited. The title to Insanity was Space Cats, Keith Webb's idea. He came up with it, just five minutes left to spare. We couldn't decide between to Insane and to Insanity. Seems pretty obvious now. Paul Gardner. Crash to Insanity hit store shelves in 2004 and gained a mixed reception to put it lightly. Reviews mostly praised the game's graphics and open world areas, but almost universally panned it for an unruly camera and unresponsive controls. The Crash community was even harsh on it, some loving it for being different, smaller group, others missing the traditional platforming of prior games. It's definitely earned the infamy of being the Crash game that you either love it or you hate it. I think it was very challenging for us to make Twin Sanity. It was our first game as a team, and for a lot of us it was our first game, period. Looking back now, I think most of us feel it was a great experience and have a lot of affection for the game. I wouldn't say that we were happy with it. There's so many things we wanted to do and so many glitches, <laughs> but I think we would all agree it has a really great spirit to it, which I think was a result of the passion and energy the whole team put into Twin Sanity. It feels like a, a handmade Crash Bandicoot game. E even when we were arguing, it was always about how we could make the game better. It feels like it was made with love. Paul Gardner. Numerous videos on YouTube are dedicated to the countless bugs and glitches in the game. Given time, Twin Sanity would receive its cult following, with fan sites devoted to it. Still, Twin Sanity would remain as one of the lowest selling Crash titles. How much of a factor was this in Universal not hiring Traveler's Tales again after Twin Sanity? It's hard to say. TT did have plans for a possible follow-up to Twin Sanity, according to Keith Webb. It was to be called Cortex Chaos, where Crash would be sucked into a television via a remote from Cortex delivered to his house. Each level being a different TV show. The Wild West, black and white, old cartoons. He said the most developed idea was a medical drama level, where Crash would chase around enemies carrying big needles. 
Alas, this would never come to be, as Universal would choose a new company to continue the legacy of Crash. TT Oxford also had another Crash Racing game in the works, known as Clash Crash Racing. The idea would have had personalized cars for each character, and the cars could fuse together. TT wouldn't get to make Clash Crash Racing either, as this racing game would be handed over to another studio, just like Nitro Kart years earlier. Man, TT just struck out when it came to Crash Racing games. TT Oxford would eventually close down as head John Burton found it too hard to work with two studios in two different locations. Then a year after the release of Twin Sanity, Traveler's Tales merged with Giant Entertainment, who held the exclusive rights to the LEGO game franchise to officially become TT Games. Then in 2007, Warner Brothers Interactive would buy them. TT would go on to make LEGO game after LEGO game after LEGO game where they remain happy to this day in Lego hell. Everything is awesome. Everything is cool when we're part of the team. Everything is awesome when we're living our Thirteen years after the release of Twin Sanity, and sixteen years after the Wrath of Cortex, came... Crash Bandicoot, the Insane Trilogy, a full remake of the first three Crash games from Naughty Dog. It became a huge success and got fans asking for more Crash games. But what would be next? To say remakes of Wrath of Cortex and Twin Sanity didn't cross fans' minds, would be an understatement. Keith Webb, one of the original game developers on Twin Sanity, came out with this letter of congratulations to Activision and Vicarious Visions on their success of the Insane Trilogy. He would also go on to say he would love to come back and work on a Twin Sanity remake, along with a handful of ex-Twin Sanity devs, as a lot of content was cut from the game. This would be their one chance to make Twin Sanity a complete vision for what they always wanted it to be. Alas, Activision had other plans, as in 2020 saw the release of the trailer for Crash Bandicoot 4, It's About Time, and in one famous line from the trailer would crush all hope of any remakes for the Traveler's Tales Crash games. How many times have you beaten this clown anyway? Three. Really? Only three? <laughs> Funny. Seemed like more. And with that, all of Chi-Chi's Crash games would remain a thing of the past. Forever. But these days, you never know. TT was never able to find the magic and revitalize the Crash Bandicoot from the Naughty Dog days. Or at least, the financial magic that Vivendi Universal was seeking. Crash would now be returning to America and heading north to Canada, where he would make an even more radical change. My powers were useless against them. <laughs> but that's a story for another day. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the channel and leaving a like. Dislikes are fine too. I'd love to hear your thoughts on TT's Crash Games and how they affected you for better or worse. I'm Kev, signing off. Until next time.